Hello, I uh, wanted to give a video tutorial for the yield curve problem on the first midterm. That's problem number uh, 8 on version A on some people's exams and it's version number 15 on others. In this problem you have a mound shaped yield curve uh, for a one year maturity, i.e. a short term borrowing rate, it's down at uh, 10, at, uh, sorry, at 5%. Oh, and there we go. Uh, for a 10-year maturity, it's up at 10%. And then for a 20-year maturity, uh, it is back down to 5%. So I think the problem was maybe a little bit ambiguous. You weren't sure whether this is a one-year maturity or a one-day maturity. It doesn't matter. You can interpret it however you want. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to interpret this as the one-year maturity. Okay. Uh, it mentions uh, that you're supposed to use the equation from the liquidity premium theory to justify your answer. We're going to do that, but since the equation from the liquidity premium theory is very close to the equation from the expectations theory, and since the expectations theory formula is a little bit simpler, we're going to start with the expectations theory formula. If you have any questions about these, uh, the expectations theory formula is formula number two on page 129, and the liquidity premium formula is formula number three on page 132. So you can check that. Anyway, if you so we're going to be working with formula two for most of the time, and then we'll move forward later on. So let's uh, apply that formula to one year, two year, three year, four year, and five year bonds. This is just kind of a simple exercise. It's just basically saying that if you want to buy a two-year bond, then you take the average of the current and next year uh, short-term rates, add them up and divide by two. If you want a three-year bond, you take the average of the current next year and year after rates. If you want a four-year bond, it's the current next year, year after, and year after that rates, etc. Fairly simple. Now as we go back up to the yield curve, let's see what we know about these. We know that the current rate is 5% but that it goes up after that. You see from the, the curve sloping upward like that. Now, we don't know how steeply it is uh, moving upward. Um, so yeah, it goes up like that. We don't know how steeply it's going upward, so we don't. you can't tell from the graph exactly what the, the two period interest rate is, but for simplicity, let's just assume uh, that it's 6%, just for pedagogical to explain it. So this says that the average, that, that the first year rate is 5%, but the average of the first and the second uh, short, sorry, the current and next year's short term rates is 6%. Hmm. What does that tell you about next year's rate? Well, if the average is at 6%, that means that uh, the last year rate, sorry, the current rate is pulling it down. That's a 5%, so this is pulling the average down. It means that this one must be higher than uh, 6%, right? That's what this says here. In fact, you can figure out exactly what it is. If you put the numbers in, since you know that this number is 5%, uh, and you know that this is 6%. This is an equation with one unknown, and uh, therefore you can solve for i sub t plus 1. It's going to be 7%. But in general, since we don't know that this number is 6%, all we really know is that this number must be bigger than this number, because this number is the thing which pulls this average upward. Okay, simple enough. So if we go back to the graph, we can say that the short-term rates, if we were to put them on the same graph, the short-term rates must be higher than the yield curve because the short-term rates are exactly what is pulling the yield curve upward. Let's look at the three-year bond to see if we can clarify this a little bit more. Again, we don't know what the three-year uh, what the interest rate is on the three-year bond, but we do know from the expectations theory that the interest rate on the three-year bond is going to have to equal the average of the current short-term one-year rate uh, and next year's one-year rate and the one-year rate from the year after. Well, since the average of these two is just going to be equal to the two-year rate, we know that the average of these two is going to be lower than the average of all three, right? 
We said before that the average of these two is 6%, and the average of all three is going to be 6.5%. And that means that this guy, this third term, must be pulling the average up. It must be higher than the average of all three to pull it up. And therefore, it, it must be higher than 6.5. Again, what that means is that the short-term rates are going to be higher than the yield curve. Likewise, uh, for the four-year bond, we know that the average of all four of these guys has to be higher than the average of all three of these guys, because the average of all four of them is the four-year rate, whereas the average of just these three is the three-year rate. That means that this, this future short-term rate, must be higher uh, than the corresponding multi-year rate, i.e. I sub 4t. So I sub t plus 3 must be higher than I sub 4t, which means again that the short-term rates are higher than the, um, than the multi-year rates, and so on. So we've got this, this is how you, you graph the short-term rates next to the yield curve. Well, what happens when you get to the top of the yield curve? First, let me say that in general, what this means is that when the yield curve is sloping up like above, the short-term rates must be even higher than the yield curve. Let's take a look at what happens when it's sloping down then. So let's go 10 years out. We're going to here and comparing that with 11 years out. If we say that uh, the interest rate on a 10-year bond is this average and that it equals 10%, and the interest rate on an 11-year bond is this average and it equals something a little bit lower uh, than 10%, sorry, that's a typo. We'll say that that's 9.5 and that's 9.0. Uh, then, and since these terms are all the same as these terms, it must be this term which is bringing it down and making it less than 10%, i.e. the 11 year interest rate is just the average of these 11 terms. And since these first 10 terms have an average of 10%, it must be this guy that's bringing it down. So by the time we get out to the 11th year, it must be the case that the short term rate is lower than the yield curve. So the short-term rates are going to kind of go up like this. And here at the beginning, in this region, they are pulling up the yield curve. But now, once the yield curve reaches its peak and it starts to go down, they must be pulling down the yield curve. The same argument can be made from the rest. Each time you go along, you're adding an additional term. Here you're adding uh, this, uh, t this uh, i sub t plus 11th term and you're bringing down uh, the, the multi-year interest rate, i.e. the 12-year interest rate, to be uh, lower than the 11-year interest rate, it must be that I sub t sub 11 is less than I sub 12t, i.e. the short-term interest rate must be lower than the uh, multi-year interest rate. So your short-term interest rates are going to look like this. And it's going to be right here at 10 years where the two curves intersect because that is where the yield curve is flat. Okay, so that is, um, that is what this indicates about expectations regarding future short-term interest rates. Mostly what you need to get here, the most important thing, is that up until the 10th year, uh, the, the um, short-term interest rates are going to be higher than uh, the multi-year interest rates, that's what we saw here, uh, th then the corresponding interest rates, i.e. that um, the expected value of I sub t plus 2 must be higher than I sub 3t, i.e. the short-term bond that ends three years out has to be have a higher interest rate than the three-year bond uh, that starts right now and the short-run bond that ends uh, four years out has to have a higher interest rate than um, the four-year bond that starts right now, etc. 
Um, and then later on after the peak, the short-term interest rates end up being lower than the, um, uh, the multi-year interest rates indicated by the yield curve. Okay, what does that mean for the, uh, what does that mean for with the liquidity premium theory. Well, like I said, when you do the liquidity premium theory, it's the exact same formula as the expectations theory. It's just that there's this extra term here uh, for the liquidity premium. So if you have this extra liquidity premium term here, and you already know that these, that I sub t equals uh, five, um, five percent and I sub uh, 10 T equals 10 percent and I sub 20 uh, equals um, uh, five percent again. Since you're adding an increasingly large number to it, it means that these terms, the short-term rates, are going to have to be lower to compensate. It means that as we go through here, um, you're going to have to draw, let's see, I'll draw a different color here. You're going to have to draw short-term rates, which are a little bit lower than you would have drawn before. Um, because when you take the average of these short-term rates, you're going to be adding this liquidity premium and increasing liquidity premium in order to get the actual yield curve. Um, so that's what the adding the liquidity premium portion uh, to the expectations theory does. Anyway, uh, I was really impressed with how people did on this. I, this was, uh, I, I conceptualized this problem as uh, probably the hardest problem on the test. Um, you know, that's what I thought going into it. Uh, I was impressed uh, just in the, the quick grading that I did at how many points people got from this. So uh, good job on that. Um, I guess that's it. I hope it helps. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.